Best Paper Award winners. Laura Devendorf will give the presentation. And um, after the presentation, uh, we'll have a, a short celebration um, as, as you get ready for questions to hand out the, the Best Paper Certificates. Please, Laura. All right. Thanks, Bjorn. Um, so I'm presenting our paper, which is called I Don't Want to Wear a Screen, Probing Perceptions of and Possibilities for Dynamic Displays on Clothing. So while I am only one person up here presenting, this came out of a collaboration between quite a lot of people who put quite a lot of work into the project. And it was a collaboration between UC Berkeley, as Bjorn said, and Google Advanced Technology and Projects, Project Jacquard. So what some of you probably saw yesterday during the Project Jacquard talk was this vision they have to add interactivity into fabrics. Um, and they're doing this by creating a custom yarn, a custom conductive yarn that can withstand massive manufacturing that's already taking place in, in fabric production. And when we began this collaboration, they were looking largely at sensing and how we can add capacitive touch to fabrics. So the Berkeley team thought it would be nice if we complemented this work by looking at display. So naturally, we were attracted to this growing body of work at the intersection of fashion and technology. Can everyone hear me? Good? Good. Um, and this is a really exciting and growing field. And this is not by any means all of the work, but it's just a representative sample. Um, but this work is really kind of true to fashion. It's agenda setting, and it's provocative, and it's conceptual. But it leaves us wondering what happens when it leaves the runway, and it enters much more messy context of every life everyday life. So for this, we're really seeking a vision of a stylish technology. So while people may or may not be very fashionable, everyone has style. We all make choices about what we're going to wear, and those choices are informed by both our own preferences, but also how we want to be perceived, how we want to be in the world, and what kind of experiences we want to potentially open up. So the driving question for this research then becomes, if we add these dynamic displays into clothing, you know, into our own personal style, how do they become meaningful? How do we understand how they're meaningful? So we did that through a two-part process. One was developing a novel textile display technology we call Ebb. And we call it Ebb because it's very slow. It looks much more like the ebb and flow of the tides than what you might see on your, your cell phone screen, which is very fast. And we took these swatches, which demonstrate a range of sort of clothing possible options, and we presented them to fashion designers and non-designers, so people who wear clothes. And we asked them, you know, how would you put this in your personal style or your design practice? So I'm going to start by talking about the development of Ebb. So we were given a large skein of this very early stage Google ATAP Project Jacquard yarn or thread. And what this thread consists of is an insulated copper that's tightly wound around cotton. So our technical lead, Joanne, <laughs> looked at this and thought, well, this is a really efficient heater. So we were inclined to think of display possibilities that reacted to heat. So we looked at thermochromic pigments. Um, and what we did is we created these thermochromic paints, and we ran the thread on the bobbin winder of a sewing machine through the paint and created these spools of thermochromic thread. So I want to show you just, if you're not familiar with thermochromics, how this works. You supply electricity to the threads, and they lose their color and reveal the base thread. And then when you cut off electricity, they regain their color. So it's very gradual. It's very slow. It almost looks more like breath than a rapid change. So it's a very different aesthetic effect. So through these early experiments, there was one really key insight. And that was that there was this correlation between density and color change. And this makes sense because the heat isn't confined to the copper wire. It spreads across the body of the fabric. So we began to see that if we supplied, you know, increasingly large amounts of um, electricity to the threads, we would see the areas where they're more densely packed change first, and the areas where there's more air around the thread change last. So with this idea, we were thinking, oh, we can create these kind of programmable threads that have one input but can change in various different ways in various different regions. So we looked specifically to crochet and weaving as fabric production techniques to explore this cross-heating effect with. So the crochet explorations we did in-house with a number of expert crochet enthusiasts on our team. Uh, and we explored multicolor crochet, really trying to do color mixing, and also lacy crochets, which had a wide range of different densities. 
We also collaborated with a professional weaver, and from her we learned about all these different weaving techniques we kind of had at our disposal to explore. And we did a number of tests that looked at how densely packed we would have to have the conductive threads within the weave, what kind of base threads that we would need to use to kind of leverage the heat in different ways, and we conducted a ton of experiments around what the possibilities were for weaving. And in the end, we ended up using or exploring three different weaving techniques. One is plain weave, which is the most basic weaving technique where a number of threads are joined together by one thread in a perpendicular direction. The next is woven inlay, which is a lot like embroidery, but it's worked in as the weave is completed and not added after. And a double weave, which is a 3D weaving technique um, that works two layers of fabric at multiple, at multiple times. I'm sorry, at the same time, multiple layers of fabric. So we produced a number of swatches, and from those we selected seven that we thought best represented a range of different clothing-specific opportunities. And we made those swatches dynamic by adding them to just an Arduino Pro Mini with a 3.5, I'm sorry, 3.7 volt lithium ion battery. And for swatches where we had a lot of control inputs, we used a servo driver to do pulse width modulation to the threads. So I want to show you some of the highlights of these, um, of these studies. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit on this first slide about this recurring theme you're going to see, which is there's a schematic in the lower left, and then there's some technical specifics about how much power each one of these motifs took. The time on the end talks about how long it took for it to fully change color, but not to return to the, its original color. So it's sort of a half time. So this first one is a density crochet. So it has one input, but because it's a lace, you can see that the color changes in a different order. So we're creating an animation across the crochet motif, so to speak. The second was inspired by an idea of like a wearable multi-state button. So we created a crochet that had two different colors that could be independently controlled. So we can turn on and off the blue or on and off the red. Then when we were exploring weaving, we created a grid using an inlay technique. We created 16 different grid cells in a 4x4 four four pattern, and each one is individually controllable. So we supplied power to the threads just using a random generator, and it created this slow shimmering across the fabric. Everyone loves stripes. They're one of the most classic sort of style elements. So we explored how stripes might work in something like this. So using a plain weave, we created 10 individual sections along the weft, and we supplied power to them individually. So in this, you can kind of see there's a stripe that's sort of walking down your fabric. Uh, my personal favorite is the woven seven segment display, which really crashes old technology with new technology. Um, and here we used an inlay, inlay technique to create each of the seven segments, and then supplied power in such a way as to sort of circulate through the number order. So there has been a lot of work that looked at thermochromic as a way to do textile-based display. And our work joins a subset of that work that really looks at the way that the conductive element is woven into the fabric itself instead of applied after the fabric has been produced. But unique to Ebb is the way that we coat the threads before they're um, integrated into a fabric. So a lot of the other work you see uses silk screen to apply the thermochromic pigment to a completed fabric. And because of that, we get to explore a more efficient thread coupling, a wider range of fabric production techniques like inlay and crochet, and we achieve a really rich visual texture that comes from something like a yarn dye, where you get a really rich heathered texture across the fabric. So with all our swatches you know, equipped with those, we set out to sort of engage users on what these would mean in their personal style. So I want to just return to this concept of stylish technology because it really informed our analysis. So we drew from a 1979 book by Dick Hedbidge called Subcultures, and it talks about style and how style is meaningful. And in Subcultures, he writes that style is a visible construction. It's a loaded choice, and it directs attention to itself. It gives itself to be read. So what's being read in style is not literal. It's sort of this mashup of all these meaningful elements. And they reference different histories, different styles, different ways of being. So you're juxtaposing these elements to create these non-specific but non-random statements. 
And you're using these to both kind of relate to who you are as a person and to put yourself out to the world and sort of hope different kind of meetings or experiences happen. So we wanted to explore what kind of associations people would have with Ebb and what kind of experiences they saw Ebb provoking in their daily life and their style. And we asked five fashion designers and 12 non-designers to look at the swatches we created and just have maybe a 90-minute or so discussion about which swatches they were attracted to, how they would wear them, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the associations. So people used a lot of really evocative language to talk about Ebb. Um, They called it trustworthy, ghostly, beautiful, zen-like, elegant, and something like an heirloom. And often when they were talking about Ebb, they were contrasting it to what they knew of dynamic displays. So most displays that change based on information are on our phone screen. And they had a lot of very colorful language for this as well. They called it plastic. A lot of them complained about these being distracting. One said that there's enough glare in my life as it is, and one participant said that his phone was the gateway to hell. (laughs) So a lot of times these were sort of linked to these kind of physical properties of the material. So Ebb was non-emissive, which really made it feel more like a fabric than a screen. And it was really richly textured. You know, you feel it when you move your hand across the fabric. So one of the participants said, even the worst decision you make within the constraints of this design system would still make a really classy, nice thing. It has a latency that's way too high for advertising. So it wasn't even, it wasn't always about the historical associations. It was also about what the potential could be for the future. And the ability for it not to be used in advertising was really appealing to a lot of people. So second, I want to move into these envisioned experiences. So one participant imagined a shirt with a graphic that would slowly move across his chest throughout the day. And he saw this as a kind of trick or like an inside joke he would have with his friends, making them say, oh, you know, wasn't this over there at some point? So this kind of interaction was appealing to more than one person in our study. Others talked about this as a way to do kind of an ambient or a peripheral display where they wanted to have access to some kind of meaningful information In this case, somebody wanted their stripes on their scarf to represent transit times and when their bus was coming. And she wanted these on on her scarf and not to be numbers but stripes so she could be aware of the information but also remain socially present to the people she was interacting with. So one of the designers noted how you don't need to change an entire shirt to give it a different feel. And she saw Ebb as a way to sort of program your shirt for the day just by changing a really minimal element like a collar. Another imagined sort of connecting her digital and physical activities. So she imagined a shirt with something on her shoulder that would light up when she was in physical proximity to somebody she swiped right on in Tinder. Um, And she saw this as a way to kind of infuse her daily life with the potential to kind of find out one of these people, because physical and digital interactions are usually very different. Another didn't really want to show it to anyone, but she loved the texture of the seven-segment display and imagined having it on her inner wrist as a, as a watch. And finally, one of our fashion designers thought this was a kind of nice way to comment on technology, fashion, and culture. So she imagined a dress with a bodice that would respond to the number of likes someone had on Facebook. And when we asked her why, she said, well, Facebook and fashion are both these surfaces You know, they're not our real selves. They're these sort of curated collections of ourselves, and she liked that contrast. So if you walk out of here with two things, this is what I want them to be. That if we're thinking about displays on clothing, I'd like that we think about them as canvases and not necessarily wearable screens. So if we look at Ebb in real time, it has really terrible heuristics as a screen. It's really slow. It's volatile, so a wind can blow your stripe away. It has a limited lifespan, and it's, it's very low resolution. But if we think about you know, this overall visual effect and how they become present to users, these aren't necessarily limitations. They're just different. So we might think of different design solutions. We might think of things moving all over fabrics instead of just making a really high-resolution screen and sort of pasting it onto a garment you know, in the end. So the next thing I want to talk about is ambiguity and abstraction and how it played into our study. Um, 
So we saw a lot of ways that people really prefer these ambiguous and, and abstract representations on their clothing. So with the Tinder shirt, we asked this participant, wouldn't you rather have an arrow? And she said, no, like I don't want them, I don't want it to force a, a meeting. I just like this idea of having a potential meeting. So this idea of abstraction was a way to kind of curate how the technology was mediating this experience. So it was nice when technology sort of created a serendipitous kind of encounter, but she didn't need it to sort of make that encounter happen. So the chance was really an integral part of this experience. So there's been a lot of work in HCI that's looked at ambiguity. And there's, um, it's growing out of Gaver's original article. And they've argued that ambiguity is a resource for design in various contexts. And we're seeing style as another of these contexts. Um, but if we're thinking about ambiguity in fashion, we need to think about users a little bit differently. In one sense, we have the person and how they're relating to their t-shirt. But there's also this audience that's also relating to the t-shirt. And here, the character, the person, everything we know about them or don't know about them, the environment they're in, it all adds context to the display to be interpreted. It's a backdrop. And it allows different audiences to interpret this thing differently. So style and technology operate with a different set of metrics. While we might want technology to be very specific and fast and informative, we might want style to be nonspecific and complex and even contradictory in some of our studies. So we think stylish technology should leverage abstraction and ambiguity to honor this personal complexity. So moving forward, we're currently doing a study that will be presented at DIS looking at biosignals and how shirts can respond to our biosignals and one, why we would even want that, and two, how it helps us relate to our body and maybe encourage us to do more interpretive work around those signals. And finally, beyond just style, we think textile displays, which are with us in our everyday lives, can shape how we experience our bodies, what we notice in our environments, and how we relate to our friends and loved ones. So we advocate for design approaches that respect uncertainty and see it as something that infuses daily life with potential, not something that technology should so it should take away. So with Ed, the slowness, the volatility, the ghostly changes all seemed really well suited to this kind of stylish interaction. Thank you.